Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 23rd, 2015, and my guest is George Selgin, Senior Fellow and Director of the Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives at the Cato Institute and Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Georgia. George, welcome back to EconTalk. Oh, thank you, Russ. It's great to be back. Now, this conversation is going to draw on a lengthy blog post you made at uh, Alt-M, the blog that discusses uh, monetary policy during and after the Great Recession – And you start by talking about the trade-off between preventing a financial meltdown at any particular time and the challenge of moral hazard. What is that trade-off? Well, very simply, uh, it's a a choice between allowing firms to fail, particularly banking firms, but not just banking firms, and taking the risk that their failure will cause problems for other firms and perhaps lead to subsequent failures, uh, as a, uh, opposed to uh, 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 allow, uh, rescuing them in order to contain the failure. So if you, if you rescue them, you avoid the immediate problem of triggering further failures, but you also create a moral hazard that consists of the expectation on the part of other firms that they will be rescued should they get in trouble. And yeah. so this is the difficult choice that central bankers face. Yeah, the metaphor I like is preventing forest fires. If you try to put out every fire immediately, so you never have a fire, eventually enough stuff accumulates uh, underbrush and twigs and dead trees that there's going to be a fire that comes along that you can't put out without a huge amount of damage. And that's really the history uh, to some extent in the modern era of Yellowstone National Park and other areas. So we rescue banks from disaster, which at the time seems like a good thing. We avoid the costs, but that encourages banks to be reckless. That in turn creates the conditions for a meltdown that's particularly unpleasant. I think my argument, which I think we we both agree on this, is that that's part at least of what happened in in 2008. Uh, Previous rescues uh, led to this expectation of rescue. And now that we've rescued again with such zeal, uh, we're we're risking a, a future crisis, which, of course, we're going to be right on. So we, we can't lose this bet <laughs> just as long <laughs> no, as we live long enough. No, so no it's one kind ever of a, lost <laughs> money predicting that a financial crisis would come eventually. So it's kind of uh, a ch- – it, uh, uh, it sounds prescient. We have to be careful. It, it is a little bit um, – Well, some people predict one every year <laughs> and then make a great deal about it uh, when the, when it finally comes about. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, involved in that racket. I'm merely – uh, predicting that there will be another one someday. Yeah, I guess the question, I, I guess the claim that our view would have to uh, imply is that it's going to get worse and worse each time. Each time there's one, it's it's uh, it should be less and less pleasant and more and more costly to uh, to to put out. Absolutely. Uh, once uh, the real change, the real sea change, I think, uh, came with the uh, rescue of. Continental Illinois, yep. and uh, that uh, that really is what launched Too Big to Fail. That doctrine had been there implicitly, I suppose, before that, but uh, that uh, that particular intervention made it uh, a, a clear reality. And as far as uh, large financial firms were concerned, from that point onward, they were playing a, a different game, a game in which at least some part of their uh, risk-taking was perceived by them to be uh, uh, subsidized, as it were, by by the uh, Federal Reserve. And uh, uh, and this uh, was, of course, a, a new kind of moral hazard. There had, been, there had been moral hazard in the system as a result of deposit insurance, and we saw how that could get pretty serious uh, in the... Uh, 80s with the SNL crisis, uh, <clears throat> but uh, but now that uh, the extent of uh, 
implicit insurance had been broadened tremendously uh, by the uh, doctrine of too big to fail. And that's what we've been dealing with ever since. Every rescue of a big firm only serves to reinforce the expectation of future rescues. And Continental, Illinois was uh, 1984. That's so we're correct. talking about a 25, approximately quarter of a century, 24 year um, chance for it to fully come home to roost. I, I want to point out uh, that in my essay on the crisis and in others that people have written, they don't just point with hindsight, which is, of course, a lot easier to tell an ex post narrative, although in inherently that is what it is to some extent. You have to be honest about it. But at the same time, there were people in real time who were uh, waving the uh, the concern, waving around the concerns that this that these rescues in '84, Mexico in the mid '90s, and other uh, long term capital management that these were um, going to lead to problems. People were, I think, aware of the of the real effects. Absolutely, many good economists and 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 some people in the business as well. Uh, saw what was coming, and the irony of this is that you, it, there is something of a self-fulfilling n nature to the notion of too big to fail. When the smallest firms were, uh, uh, when the small firms relative to what's happened since got in trouble, uh, it turns out that in many cases, like Ca Continental Illinois, it was by no means small at the time, but it would be small compared to the, some of the rescues since. The uh, studies afterward cast tremendous doubt on the claim that the failures of those smaller, uh, too big to fail firms uh, really did or would have had sy such severe systematic consequences as those who defended the bailouts at the time predicted. In fact, it's pretty clear to everyone now that if Continental Illinois had been allowed to fail, we would have gotten over it. And only a relatively small number of not very important other financial firms would have been adversely affected. But of course, as a result of that bailout, uh, the expectation of, of such bailouts has increased and the consequence is that bigger and bigger firms end up being bailed out. Of course, at some point, you get to firms that really are too big to fail. Yeah. <laughs> but but well, the reason the you find part. yourself in that situation is because you uh, treated others as too big to fail when they really weren't. And I think the point to emphasize is that they become, quote, too big to fail because they have these creditors uh, who – Allegedly, if the firm fails, then the creditors are going to fail. There'll be this cascading domino effect, and and there's an inherent uh, subjectivity, I should say, about this that you know makes it hard to assess it empirically. Obviously, it's challenging to know how important one failure might be. It's very challenging to know how hard it might be to unravel a firm in a, in the state of bankruptcy. W what the consequences of that would be, but I think the economics of it is very straightforward, which is lenders. Because they have uh, limited upside and uh, can be wiped out on the downside, are tend to be cautious. When they become uncautious, there are only really two possibilities. One is they're foolish, which is always possible. But mm -hmm. the second is they believe rationally or perhaps subconsciously that their downside has been protected by a government uh, insurance plan. Uh, and I think that's – the question is how big is that effect? You can argue about it. Uh, let's let's move on to the to the back to the Fed for a minute and the the 2008 crisis. I, I want to talk about an economist we've mentioned before. Uh, his name is uh, Walter Badgett, and he's confusing to talk about because his name is B A G E H O T. And I mentioned on the program before when I was in graduate school, I thought his name was pronounced Bagaho, and I had no idea who this Badgett guy people were, were talking <laughs> about. Um, but it's Walter. It's ba it's Walter, right? I get the first name right. Yes, it is. Yeah, Walter. So so yeah, that one's easy. But uh, Walter Badgett, in uh, a book called Lombard Street, uh, laid out a set of principles for central bankers that most economists would say are the right principles. What is Badgett's set of principles or rules for how a central banker should deal with a a financial crisis such as the one we were in in two thousand and eight? 
Well, of course, Badgett couldn't have anticipated the particular crisis we had now, uh, had recently, but his principles are very general ones that m many economists think are as applicable now as uh, they were when he set them uh, out. Which is, roughly, are, which is roughly when? When, did, when was he writing? In eight, eight, 1873 or just before, uh, he was responding to the 1866 uh, crisis that uh, England had faced and uh, presumably was developing uh, Lombard Street and working on it in the years following uh, that crisis. Uh, but it came out in 1873. The basic doctrine or, do uh, or dictum, as it's since been called, that he came up with is that in a, faced with a crisis, the Bank of England, he was specifically referring to the Bank of England, should lend freely at high rates on good banking collateral. And uh, there were various reasons for this. It, uh, <clears throat> the high rates were partly in intended to, con to uh, deal with an aspect of uh, financial crises at that time, which is not necessarily uh, important today, and that's what Badger called an external drain. External drain is when the country as a whole was losing gold or suffering an adverse balance of payments with uh, the rest of the world. High interest rates were partly intended to combat that adverse drain, that external drain of specie by a attracting capital from abroad mm. that would offset the tendency for this drain to keep going. Uh, <clears throat> the high rates, however, also had uh, the uh, role of uh, discouraging banks from borrowing from the central bank just to take advantage of a, of a subsidy and to relend. The idea was that uh, the central bank should be providing liquidity to illiquid but solvent firms, but shouldn't be just providing cheap credit for them to uh, uh, to use uh, to arbitrage lending with. So let's just for a sec. Why don't you explain? Because uh, the key distinction there is illiquid but solvent. That's uh, right. Firm, banks can be uh, insolvent, in which case they're probably going to be illiquid. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, well, not necessarily. I guess they could be insolvent but liquid. You quickly find out just how insolvent they are, but. Um, in general, we're, we, we, it's easy to get those confused. So explain what, yeah. and I've just made it worse, but uh, help, help out the listeners and, and explain what a solvent bank that is illiquid means. A solvent bank is a bank that uh, where the, the value of its assets is at least equal to the value of its liabilities. Now, <laughs> this is not a, uh, a very hard and fast notion. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a lot of wiggle room depending on how the assets are valued. Generally and traditionally in banking, uh, the, 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 the value of the assets would not be reckoned on the basis of what we now call mark to market or uh, that is you wouldn't always adjust their for their current value you would look at their realized value at maturity what are they likely to be worth when they mature uh, and that that allows that allows bankers to not have to panic just because their assets have fallen in value in the middle of a crisis in any event though the idea is that the assets should be should provide sufficient revenue and should uh, be uh, 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 paid off as they mature in to an extent that would allow the bank to cover all of its liabilities now liquidity is 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 different liquidity has to do with the ability of a bank to service its liabilities in the short run that means being able to come up with the cash to meet current withdrawals to pay currently promised interest to liability holders, a bank could find itself illiquid in the sense that it's got good assets, but they're good in the long run. They're gonna yield enough revenue in the long run, or if their loans are gonna be paid back in the long run and the bank is going to uh, uh, do well as far as that concerned, but might still be short of cash for meeting immediate obligations to other banks and to customers. So, and so that's a case of illiquidity where the bank's got good assets, but it's not realizing enough of them for the current cash needs that it faces. So the, the, the jargon here is the bank should be the, quote, lender of last resort to keep banks from uh, 
dealing with uh, their challenge of, of liquidity that is inevitable from time to time. But they should not be lending to everybody. They should be lending That's to right. firms that are solvent as best as the bank can tell. And for listeners, mild spoiler alert coming uh, in, the, in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. And we've talked about this scene before when George Bailey cancels his honeymoon to use his honeymoon money to bail out uh, Bailey's, Bailey's savings and loan. What he's doing is he's using his own personal cash uh, to keep the bank – the bank is solvent, as he explains to the people who want their money because it's a run. He says, oh, but your money's tied up in so-and-so's house because he can't mm -hmm. claim it quickly. He can't. He's going to be getting payments, the mortgage payments, because so-and-so is employed and eventually the money will be available. But if everybody wants their money at once, they can't get it. And George uses his own uh, personal funds to stem that run. Correct? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And uh, a run is a is a is a – an extreme example of a situation that confronts can confront uh, a bank with extreme liquidity needs. It needs a lot of cash all at once. Uh, yet it may have perfectly good loans and other assets, uh, but uh, uh, unless it can accommodate or meet these needs for liquidity, it's only going to find that the panic gets worse and it can be bankrupted uh, as a result of panicking customers not getting any money. Usually the rule is if a bank doesn't pay, if it runs out of cash on the spot, that's it. It's 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 failed. That's the definition of failure, regardless of its long-term prospects. So uh, it, so uh, in, a, in a situation where there's a run, you have to have uh, access to liquidity. Now, it's important to recognize, though, on the other hand, that if a bank really isn't solvent. That is, if it's made some bad decisions, it's holding a lot of bad assets. It's not in anyone's interest to keep it going. It's not in anyone's interest because, first of all, you can't keep it going forever because it's it's ultimately going to fail. So all you can do is delay that failure. The second point is that uh, it's wasting resources. That is, it's an inefficient firm. So we want it out of the system. You want to weed it out. Uh, and um, uh, if you keep it alive, it's simply going to compound its losses. Uh, there's a good chance it will, because a bank, once it becomes insolvent, lacks the uh, incentives to manage money as well, because once people are off the hook, once the capital is war has been exhausted, well, the temptation is to use any money to shoot the moon, to say maybe we can make some, you know, uh, Hail Mary investments here and manage somehow to save the bank. But if not, we can't be any worse off than before because we've already been wiped out. So it's very dangerous to put money into a solvent, uh, sorry, an insolvent institution, uh, apart from the fact that uh, there's there's no... There's no real need for it because assuming there are plenty of other solvent banks around, what you want to do is keep keep them from being knocked over by the falling dominoes of the insolvent institutions. You don't need to keep the insolvent ones themselves uh, alive on artificial support. And the other issue is uh, was referenced by a, a very nice paper by George Akerlof and Paul Romer uh, called Looting. Looting, mm -hmm. L-O-O-T-I-N-G, which is about how an insolvent firm uh, that has access to capital is going to essentially overpay its its uh, officers. The people are – there's a terrible incentive problem then for the yes. officers and um, they detail some of the ways that people exploited that in the past. It's um, it's a very depressing article and – Indeed, uh, indeed. That's all part of the uh, the perverse incentives that kick in. As soon as a firm no longer has skin in the game, so to speak, that is, as soon as the capital has been wiped out, which is the definition of insolvency, the, the uh, yes, it's worth less than the liabilities, then any additional funding supplied to that institution leads to all kinds of, or can lead to all kinds of uh, m misconduct. So ideally, you want to shut down an insolvent institution right away. The last thing you want to do is to give it more scarce resources to play with.
So let's turn to the 2008 crisis and um, do some um, uh, grading of the participants. Uh, most, I would say, economists point to the failure to bail out Lehman Brothers as the uh, turning point of the crisis. Uh, I don't agree with that, and I don't think you do either. I point to the uh, bailout of Bear Stearns creditors. Basically, the Fed uh, took $30 billion worth of assets onto its books, off the books of Bear Stearns, so that J.P. Morgan could buy Bear Stearns over one weekend of, of alleged crisis. And here's That's correct. And you quote – in your article, you quote Ben Bernanke in his new book, The Courage to Act, uh, and Bernanke writes the following. Some would say in hindsight that the moral hazard created by rescuing Bear – Reduce the urgency of firms like Lehman to raise capital or find buyers. But in hindsight, I remain comfortable with our intervention. Our intervention with Bayer gave the financial system and the economy a nearly six-month respite at a relatively modest cost. Now, there's some ellipses in there. You, you don't quote that literally um, word for word. Uh, it's word for word, but it, you've, you've left out some things. But if that is an accurate representation of – of what uh, Bernanke wrote, it's extraordinary. I, I'm astounded by it. So uh, why don't you – I assume you are too, so why don't you comment on it? Well, uh, I don't think the ellipses uh, leave out anything that uh, would alter the the uh, the meaning as conveyed uh, by that quote. I'm pretty pretty careful about it. <laughs> not, not, not playing yeah, that trick. Yeah, I understand, but um, it just – it has to be mentioned. I have to be – I have to yes. just make it clear. Well, as I put it in the article, I think what, uh, what he ignores is that this respite was really a period in which firms, other very large firms, and there were, there were other investment banks that were uh, substantially larger than Bear, uh, thought they were off the hook and behaved accordingly and uh, and – Indeed, it's during this time that these bad incentives we're just talking about are are are, are starting to kick in, particularly at Lehman Brothers, and uh, with very very adverse consequences. Because uh, had it not been for the Bear bailout, Lehman would have had an incentive to essentially prepare for bankruptcy, which is what uh, a firm that uh, is probably insolvent or has a, uh, is looking at a situation that is likely to render it insolvent normally would do when it has no prospect of getting uh, a bailout. It's going to start planning for the worst. It's going to retrench. It's certainly not going to uh, make uh, bigger gambles uh, 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 that uh, there's, and it's not going to have any more money to play with for that p purpose. So, uh, again, this was something that was anticipated by many people at the time. I mentioned Michael Lewis's comments uh, shortly after the bear crisis. I quote them in my piece uh, where he says the fact that Lehman is still alive and is still a going concern is because of this bailout. And he predicts that some pretty bad stuff is in store. Uh, presumably, he anticipated, as many people did, that the Fed would be driven to eventually bail Le Lehman's out. Of course, what it uh, did instead was to let Lehman fail. Uh, I'm reminded, <laughs> I actually think that letting Lehman fail in itself uh, might have been a good thing, but in the context, it was quite harmful because uh, because it was contrary to all of the expectations at the time. What I mean is it was harmful in the sense that it was a shock to the system. It's an unexpected shock, I think. Unexpected yeah, shock. That's what you mean by shock, essentially. It was an unexpected uh, turn Completely of events. Completely unexpected, and it suddenly uh, uh, generated a tremendous amount of uncertainty uh, about exactly what the Fed's policy was. After Bear, people thought, okay, it's too big to fail. Now, that's a very bad thing for them to think, and it resulted in a great deal of, of misconduct in the system, uh, as if there hadn't already been plenty of that. But uh, then the failure to, of the Fed bail out uh, Lehman caused even more disruption. There's another, there's another subtle aspect to this, Russ, that I think other writers haven't, haven't picked up on much in principle, and this gets back to Badgett, in principle, um, 
the Fed might have tried to insist that it was only bailing Bear out because Bear had sufficient collateral to justify a bailout on Bajatian lines. This is this is essentially what Bernanke claims, and he also claims that in contrast, the Fed did not, uh, Lehman did not have the collateral required to uh, 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 justify Fed support to it. So what what uh, Bernanke has tried to argue is that letting rescuing Bear or helping with that merger and then letting Lehman fail. That was consistent with following Badgett's rules. That's what uh, he, he, he argues uh, much of the time, though not consistently. Well, you, you, call his, you call his book you – his book is called The Courage to Act. Your, your blog post is called The Courage to Refuse. I would call it, uh, based on that summary, The Courage to Fantasize. Um, and I, I, I say that because the at-the-time accounts of that weekend – when Bear was about to go down, I don't think anybody sat around and said, well, you know, I think, you know, I'm looking at the balance sheet. There was panic. And so, again, to cut to cut Bernanke some slack and to give my – to be honest about our uh, – the ease with which we can criticize uh, with hindsight. We have to be honest about that. At the time, it was, a, it was terrifying. They were very afraid. Uh, there was a huge amount of pressure for them to bail out – Bear, not necessarily for good reasons, but for self-interested reasons of other bankers. Those were, of course, the people they were tending to hear from at the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so they, they made that decision. Now, their ex post justification that, oh, well, Bear had good good assets. It was – Badgett would approve. Now, we're, we're going to get to that in a second because I have a quote from you uh, right. that, that we'll look at. But I, I want to um, – I just want to add one thing to your, to your assessment of the six-month respite, which was, as you point out – that Lehman, uh, instead of getting its house in order, making a last-ditch attempt to make its uh, assets more attractive, actually went in the other direction. But the flip, which is that they 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 borrowed money that they probably were pretty aware of, they were unlikely to be able to repay and to get capital. They were unlikely to be able to compensate the owners for. Right, but, unless they were very lucky. Right, unless they were lucky. It's, it's never it's black and white. It's not, like, pass, it's not yes. like they planned to fail. I think it has to be. You have to be clear on what's actually going on here, but. But it's not just that, that the Fed emboldened Lehman. It's that the Fed emboldened the people who lent to them. So I, Absolutely, for me, yes, the, the yes. thing I point it's out – the creditors who matter yeah, here. The creditors so, matter. So what I point out is that the, the big crisis that everyone points to as the, as the signature disaster um, in the aftermath of, of Lehman's failure was the, the, that, the, that a number of uh, money market firms were going to break the buck. They would be unable to pay back uh, to, to hold principal. For their for their investors, and I always get confused whether it's reserve, primary, or primary reserve. But it's one of the oldest, not primary the reserve, oldest. Yeah. Primary reserve had had was at risk of going bankrupt, and then, of course, that was terrifying. And this was the justification then for the subsequent bailouts, where people said, "Well, obviously, Lehman was a mistake. We shouldn't have done that. Now we're not going to make that mistake again. We're going to make sure we bail all these other people out because if if money market funds start to go under, then who knows? We could end up with we're going to be eating uh, cat food on the streets out of um, out of cans and, and <laughs> holes in our clothes. That, that was the image. Well, not yes, literally, but, right. I can have a lot about that too, Russ. <laughs> but uh, maybe we can get to it. But my but. point, just I'll get to my point, and then you can you can add some. I'd love to hear it. But what the heck was a money market fund doing, <laughs> lending money to a firm whose balance sheet we know was not so healthy? We had, we knew they, everyone knew that Lehman's. Assets were a lot like bears. Bears were not very attractive, despite what Bernanke claims now. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the fact that they could borrow money from them, they could take investment from a money market firm, was like it, it just shows you how bad the moral hazard problem was. Absolutely, a layman and uh, had leapt uh, to the uh, head of the head of the class, as I put it, in uh, uh, the too big to fail class. Uh, the, it was uh, uh, the bailout of Bear, Bear was the first of an investment bank. Uh, there were other bigger investment banks, including Lehman. As far as creditors were concerned, Lehman was now a very safe bet uh, 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 under the circumstances. And uh, it, and it is as you suggested. It's 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 what the creditors are doing that's crucial. 
you don't care as a creditor <laughs> what the who shareholders are going to end or up with. Who pays with. you back? <laughs> That's right. As long as you think you're going to get paid back, as long as the check doesn't good. have to be. <laughs> it doesn't have to be out of the assets of the firm you're yep. you're uh, putting money in. It can be out of a, a, a bailout. Yep. Uh, and that's just that's those dollars are just as good. They smell the same and yep. all that. So. Um, uh, you're, what 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 we saw happening after Bear is money uh, rushing <laughs> to Layman's, uh, which of course wasn't happening because Layman's was suddenly perceived to be a, a better run firm than it actually was, or a firm with fewer troublesome uh, 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 mortgage-backed securities than than was the case. It was simply that uh, the perception of of its standing uh, uh, among potentially too big to fail firms had had shifted in its favor. So let's turn to the uh, the assets that bear uh, that the Fed took on its balance sheet. It did this through um, this thing it created called Maiden Lane. That's right, Maiden is, Lane One in this case. Well, this is it's interesting. The article you quote um, is uh, from Bloomberg in two thousand and ten. And I, I don't know uh, about Maiden Lane 1, but it, this is Maiden Lane 2 and 3. I'm, gonna, I'm turning to a different issue now, which is um, a lot of people argue that the Fed, uh, everything turned out fine because the Fed didn't lose any money. And my argument, and I think yours, is that that's a total red herring. Uh, we'll explain why, and then we'll move on to this particular example. Well, <clears throat> these uh, these assets – that the Fed held, it took it took them out at a tremendous uh, at uh, 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 it, it, at a time when their value was falling. And in fact, while the Fed was holding these securities, mostly mortgage-backed securities, uh, their value continued to fall. At one point, it had very substantial losses on on the portfolio of these securities. Now, it's true that eventually. Those securities uh, went back up in value, but uh, they did so mainly as a result of the Fed's concerted efforts to pump <laughs> up the value of those securities by continuing to buy them and by otherwise uh, keeping interest rates artificially low. Uh, so, of course, if you're a central bank, you can do some funny things to out of securities in your portfolio because you're a big player, but I don't think any – reasonable uh, 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 any private market participants uh, not being able to anticipate the Fed's game plan would have touched these securities with a 10-foot pole. And in fact, that's exactly why uh, the Fed had to purchase them in the case of theirs because uh, <laughs> they, were, they were considered toxic. Uh, and uh, the real question here is not – uh, ultimately, what happened to the value of the securities? If we're going back to Badgett and his uh, advice, which Bernanke repeatedly claims to follow, though he occasionally says something inconsistent with that, but he repeatedly claims that he's following Badgett, uh, there's no way that these securities, uh, these assets could be regarded as the sort of assets that would be normally used as, and accepted as collateral for for uh, uh, bank lending. So they I'm, simply I'm, wouldn't. So even I'm, the Federal Reserve's own discount window, uh, even at the discount window, uh, these assets would, n would not have been accepted. And the Fed is the lender of last resort, which means supposedly the collateral that it accepts its, at its discount window is, is, if, is, if anything, a broader consists of a broader set of securities than, than other bankers would be uh, prepared to accept. So I'll defend Ben for a minute here. Um, in 2010, uh, according to the Bloomberg article that you cite in your post, uh, Maiden Lane 2, uh, the assets uh, that they – I think they paid $34.8 billion and then they were now at that point by 2010 down to 15.3. Mm -hmm. So they were worth 44% of what they were worth originally. Uh, the face value of Maiden Lane 3's assets were $56 billion. In 2010, they were actually worth on the market $22 billion, $0.39 cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. So in theory, 
uh, the Fed had lost, oh, something on the order of over $50 billion, mm-hmm. which even – I guess even I don't know if that's a big number anymore. I, you know, <laughs> I have to I have to hesitate. I mean, I, I, the way I said it when I first said it was like, oh wow, and maybe it's not a big. It seems like a big number to me. Um, but they had lost fifty billion. Now you're suggesting that was 2010. Eventually, the value of these assets bounced back because as the Fed continued to buy them, their market value was it came clear. People were willing to pay more for these because they thought there was a chance the Fed would repurchase them. So that's one argument. But I think Bernanke would give two arguments. Here's here's – I'm going to play Bernanke. OK, so they, they plummeted. And you're going to tell me they were toxic. You're going to tell me I wasn't like Badgett. But isn't it true that there was essentially a run on the housing market, that housing prices fell temporarily due to animal spirits, a, a bursting bubble that was, was going to bounce back? So when these assets were on the books of, of firms like Bayer and others, other investment banks – it's true they don't look very very healthy, but they would bounce back eventually because this is just a temporary uh, liquidity issue effectively because the true value is going to be much higher. And the fact that we didn't lose any money on them tells you that they did eventually bounce back and they weren't risky. Well, it's not a convincing argument because the the, 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 the problems in the housing market weren't just due to fire sale losses. It wasn't as if the value of these things was collapsing because people were panicking. They were collapsing because housing prices fell and with housing prices fall, which was, they weren't falling because of a run uh, or people suddenly running away from houses or whatever it is would make house house prices start to fall. Uh, but uh, they, they were falling and default rates were rising substantially. And it was this uh, change in the uh, perceived riskiness of the assets due to the incident of incidents of defaults that was the proximate cause of the collapsing values of those mortgage mortgage backed securities not uh, not illiquidity and uh, and moreover because of the complicated nature of the securities no one including the fed really knew uh, uh, after they started to uh, lose value rapidly really knew where they would settle down. They just didn't know. So here's the puzzle. Uh, they took a gamble. Fair enough. So they, And you could argue the gamble paid off. I would argue that they just pushed the gamble down the road. We're still in the middle of it. It's too early to tell. But again, that would be my view. It's kind of easy to say yeah. that. But here, here's yes, the puzzle. Here's the puzzle. Mm-hmm. The Fed has, I think, $4 trillion worth of assets, correct? On uh, their books? Still more than that. Okay. More than that. It's, I, it's, more than one. <laughs> so, yes. so, so more than two, more than three, more than four trillion, enormous increase. And and presumably a huge chunk of that is mortgage-backed securities. They are uh, a piece of paper that promises the holder the cash flow from a set of mortgages that were thought to be very safe at the time because they were supposedly diverse. But in fact, uh, we I thought they were not so safe. Now – are you suggesting that those assets that that four trillion? I don't. I assume that's four trillion. I don't know what that's. I think that's face value. That's that's not market value. Are we? Are, that's we, right. are we suggesting the Fed doesn't mark to market? Right. If they did, you know, strangely enough. But if they did, are, do you think they'd be worth anything close to four trillion? In other words, and when we went back to two thousand and eight, when so many homes were underwater, that is, when so many people owed more on their houses than the houses were worth on the market. Has, have things turned around so much that the expected return to those assets is going to be positive? I'm not sure. I'm not I, either. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. And I think that uh, uh, the uh, the problem is that, uh, that uh, the, uh, the elephant in the room is interest rates, of course, and that that's the elephant for all all not just for the mortgage backed securities but even for the long term treasury securities that now uh make up a substantial part of the fed's balance sheet the values of all of these securities depends crucially on where interest rates are and uh uh, uh therefore uh <clears throat> what what you think their proper valuation is depends crucially on 
what you think interest rates are going to do, whether you think they're ever going to go back up again. And, uh, and this is part of the, the, uh, the great uncertainty that attaches with any long-term assets. There, there's a lot of interest rate risk, and that's why, generally speaking, these are not the sort of things that are considered good banking collateral. But you know, uh, Russ, getting back to this question of good, good collateral, it, it, we can easily think of all kinds of assets that might or might not uh, gain value that could conceivably be accepted as collateral for a bank loan, and yet no one would consider them good banking collateral. Suppose that just in normal times, somebody offered to, to uh, secure a loan with, with uh, stocks, right? Yep. Risky stocks, literally. That's well, an oxymoron. Up, I mean, that's a redundancy. They could go, they could, they could go up in value. Risky. They could yeah. go down. Right. You can imagine uh, central bank uh, accepting uh, stocks if, if the law allowed it, and uh, ending up smelling like roses because the, the stocks go up in value. And yet, who would say this is consistent with with following Badgett's dictum? It simply isn't. And I think that uh, we're not that we're closer to stocks than we are to conventional. Uh, good collateral when we're talking about many of these securities we've been talking about. It's as simple as that. Well, I think if you press Bernanke and uh, may maybe we'll try to get him on Econ Talk, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, in general, I I don't think it's so interesting to have uh, guests on who have a, a personal axe to grind who are unlikely to concede, oh yeah, I guess you're right, I did make a mistake. So it tends to be... Um, more like a press conference and less like a conversation. So I, I, I tend to avoid that, but this may be an exception. But I, I'm willing to give Bernanke bad marks on his uh, badgetosity. The question would be, uh, do we give and – and I'm also willing to give him bad marks on the trade-off between taking risk now versus risk in the future. Uh, and I guess we'll see how that one turns out, if my grade's accurate or not. But let's turn to a different question, which is putting these issues to the side – Many economists uh, salute and champion and applaud Bernanke's actions as necessary to keep the economy from uh, going uh, south. Uh, what's your judgment on that? In other words, he claims, I acted like Badgett. I saved the economy. I had the courage to act. Uh, I would argue he didn't act like Badgett. You can, we could debate that. He could maybe defend himself. But either way, I think he's sowed the seeds for future problems. But then the question is, did he at least do well in helping the economy recover from the, the recession of 2008? And where do you stand on that? No, I, I don't think he did. And, you know, I'm not a – I don't want to come across as a Bernanke basher. Even on this issue of moral hazard, I hasten to say in my article, and I, and I mean it, that the problem with the, the kinds of bailouts we saw, it's not a Bernanke problem. It's a problem that, that we would – face with any uh, human central banker, it's be hard to imagine someone who would not have acted uh, to, to rescue Bear, for example, under those circumstances. Not because it was, it's, uh, it's not that it was the right thing to do, but it takes a tremendous amount, speaking of courage, takes a tremendous amount of courage to say, no, let's let the chips fall because it's the right thing to do, and yes, there's risk, but... Uh, we've got to draw a line. And so uh, I don't fault him so much that I fault the system. Uh, and I, I do believe we need rules that would uh, uh, essentially prevent such emergency lending. I don't think that without rules we can reasonably expect uh, central bankers to use, to use discretion uh, the right way to avoid moral hazard. Uh, but there is an, there's more to uh, uh, what Bernanke's role was in the uh, <clears throat> recovery that I think he deserves to be faulted for. And particularly paying interest on reserves was a, a ludicrous policy implemented at the time uh, uh, that it was implemented in uh, October 2008. <clears throat> Basically, what's... <laughs> What the economy needed, and by then it was perfectly clear, I think, to, to anyone who stands back from the obsessive focus on targeting interest rates that seemed to have been dominant at the Fed, and it's a popular thing about in monetary economics, but let's get away from theories and look at what was happening. 
Lending was collapsing, spending was collapsing. You can see it very visibly. Now, uh, a, a not very fancy view of of what central banks should do, of what their key responsibility is, and I, I subscribe to this non-fancy view, I don't like fancy theories very much, is that their job is to see to it that the amount of liquid funds in the economy is sufficient to keep spending going, to keep spending from collapsing. If spending's collapsing, well, that means that people are not, are, are, are anxious to accumulate liquid funds that aren't, aren't really there for everybody to accumulate. So, uh, all right. What happens in October uh, 2008 is that Bernanke is concerned not with preventing a collapse in spending, but in keeping the interest rate at its designated target, which was then still 2%. And um, uh, uh, and uh, or had had I think he at some point they finally let it go to one and a half percent, but they were anxious by hook or by crook to keep it as, uh, from uh, falling as much as they could do, and then they finally latched on to this interest on reserves. The whole point of it was to make sure that interest rates would have uh, would not that they could control interest rates. Uh, and also to make sure that they could bail out laymans and expand their balance sheet without any lending being stimulated by the banking system. <laughs> so, so here you have a concerted effort to see to it that the Fed can expand its balance sheet like mad, putting money into troubled firms, but it's not going to be lent. And that's the point, because if it goes into the reserve market, interest rates will tend to fall. So we've got by hook or by crook to keep the banks from lending the extra liquidity that the Fed's created. In other words, the Fed chose to see to it through interest on reserves that the demand for reserves would go up at least as much as the supply and created, as it were, a liquidity trap where none would have been created. And by this means sought to it that the collapse in spending that occurred in 2008 would not uh, uh, be followed by a restoration of spending soon afterwards. This was a complete macroeconomic disaster, all premised on the assumption that uh, control of the federal funds rate is the important thing, no matter what's happening to total spending, which was, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, a madness, a kind of macroeconomic madness. But that claim you're making, that that's a, um, I assume that's a deduction that you're making based on their behavior. That that's not their stated argument. Oh yes, it is. That's the uh, that's the funny thing. If you go in and look carefully at the rationalizations given for interest on reserves, you'll see that it is exactly their express purpose to make sure that all the extra liquidity that the Fed is providing to make sure that all the quantitative easing it's undertaking does not bleed out (laughs) into the economy uh, through a a corresponding increase in bank lending. It was their express purpose. I can provide you quotes to that. Yeah, I'd have to see that. I mean, that is bizarre beyond words. It was their purpose to make sure that, 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 that that the money would not be lent uh, and specifically that it wouldn't find its way into the interbank market because that uh, – the, the federal funds market because that would cause the Fed to lose control of the target federal funds rate. Of course, it did ultimately lose control of it as it was bound to because the, the, the rate – the natural rate, as you might call it, was was collapsing. Uh, now, here's what's tragic about all this. I mean it's tragic in many ways, but the thing is <clears> – <throat> right? Think about this. You're worried about the, the federal funds rate falling, right? And falling specifically, falling to zero. But spending is collapsing. If spending's collapsing, that the rates are going to fall too, right? Fisher effect, deflation. Uh, but, but there's a level effect here as well. Basically, if uh, if there's less spending going on, what it means is there's less demand for everything, including funds, including credit. So. If they had acted to revive credit, 
That is, if they had not worried about maintaining or trying to maintain by hook or by crook the federal funds rate at an artificially high level, but they would have let the banks lend in, and make, make use of the extra Federal Reserve dollars out there to lend more. That would have boosted spending again and GDP, if you like. And nominal that would have nominal been GDP. Nominal GDP. And that would have eventually... Uh, caused interest rates to come back up. Instead, they get, they by by trying to keep interest rates artificially high, they all but guaranteed that they would fall and stay low. It, it's a it's a it's a a great example of um, uh, of of <laughs> uh, looking only at the at at one aspect of the problem and and losing track of the big. But I can assure you, I can come up with all kinds of quotes to, uh, uh, by the authorities. And incidentally, uh, if they had a better way to justify paying banks to hold reserves at the time that they decided to institute this policy, uh, I would like to know what it was because I haven't heard it. Yeah, so the, I challenge <laughs> you to write a, a post on that, by the way, assembling some of those quotes. In the, well, in the meanwhile, we can like link to it, but – uh, of course, people can look for themselves, but I, I, I guess the being less careful a reader and consumer of this literature than you are, you know, my if you'd ask me why did they start paying interest on reserves, I have a public theory and a private theory. The public theory, the one that I would have said they had used to justify it, was they wanted control over over monetary policy. I didn't think that the I wouldn't go. I wouldn't have gone as far as you seem to be going, which is to say. They not only wanted control over it, they wanted so much control that they didn't want the money to get into the system. Because if you make that claim, you have to argue that they don't really think monetary policy has anything to do with the real economy. It just that is just such a bizarre <laughs> claim. They think <laughs> yes, Mar you're, you're right. They think monetary policy is about interest rates. It's not about flows. It's not about quantities. It's about where the rates are. So I we, know that sounds crazy. It does sound crazy. We just it <laughs> is crazy. But this is the influence of some. Uh, contemporary monetary theories. I, uh, I'm going to mention Woodford by name because, frankly, uh, I think he's the Doctor Strange love in this story. But uh, uh, but there are many who subscribe to this view, and uh, they they felt that interest rates should stay at two percent. If they could have, they would have left that federal funds. They would have tried to hold it there forever. It was it, 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 the target became meaningless at some point because the, the no activity was happening at 2%. But the the reality is uh, that it's really true, Russ, and this is why <laughs> so you asked me whether I think Bernanke did, did something wrong. And I've got to tell you, they wanted to make sure that all the funds that – you see, up to Lehman, they were sterilizing all their emergency lending. Explain. Explain that, what that is. Okay, this is very important. They had they started out with about oh eight hundred uh, uh, oh goodness eight hundred eight hundred billion billion dollars uh, of treasury securities on the on the on the books of the Fed. Right, the standard. Uh, that's what they used to buy when they weren't buying all this before they started buying oodles of this other stuff. So as they started to acquire other assets through emergency lending, whether it was direct lending or through the uh, term auction facility or what have you. This is so-called quantitative easing. This is a, a different yeah, form well, it of – it later became it, – it, no, it wasn't quantitative easing yet. It wasn't quantitative easing yet because up to layman's, they were – sterilizing all this lending by selling treasuries as they acquired other assets. Okay. So that the total amount of, uh, of assets on their books, uh, the total size of their balance sheet didn't change. And now uh, the same philosophy that was behind the sterilization, which also uh, was accompanied by other measures, essentially there was a program having the Treasury park money at the Fed. It was all so they couldn't, wouldn't have the total amount of, of Federal Reserve dollars sloshing around in the economy increase because that would undermine monetary policy. This is what's happening uh, until layman's. So it's, imp it's uh, uh, important uh, 
to have this as a background when we asked about interest on reserves. So, um, because what it what it's what it's pointing to is the fact that the Federal Reserve was very determined that their emergency lending activities would not affect the total supply of federal funds in the economy, which was a, a, a goal predicated on the assumption that maintaining control of the federal funds rate was the most important thing uh, about monetary policy. Okay. That makes, the hang layman, on. Hang on. I got to interrupt. Yeah. I got to interrupt. Yeah. This, this, makes, this makes no sense. Now, I'm not going to say <laughs> that proves your point. I, I okay. just I, I just want to see if you can try to answer this objection or whether you can okay. say, yeah, well, it is. That's crazy, too. So mm -hmm. the, the and I, I, I want to remind listeners that they early in the early days of Econ Talk, I had the privilege of interviewing Milton Friedman and I asked him this question. You can go back and listen to it. Uh, why do they keep I said to him, your work is all about quantities, the quantity of money, its impact on the economy. Why do central bankers talk about interest rates? And he his, he essentially said well, it just it gives it makes it feel more powerful that they're they're doing that. What they're really doing is they're printing money or pulling That's it right. in, and and all of this interest rate stuff's a red herring, and it's a mistake. So putting putting that on on the as a background, how can you possibly argue if you are a central banker today that the federal funds rate is the key thing? What the federal funds rate is is the is the rate at which banks charge each other. To to move assets around on the Fed's balance sheet is that correct? Do I have that correct? Am I missing Essentially, something? Essentially, it's the rate they charge for lending uh, uh, so-called federal funds, which is bank reserves, to each other overnight. Correct. You're telling me they actually think that level that rate is the key to to good health for the economy. That's right. That's bizarre. That, no, that, but on, foot, footnote, footnote. Monetary I understand, policy is no. about regulating the federal funds rate but that can't and other be. interest it, rates it, with it. It can't be because the whole idea of, of doing that has to be that by changing the rate at which banks lend to each other, I would eventually affect what they do out in the real economy. If you actually are arguing that they tried to control that rate and also at the same time not let it get out into the economy, what could they possibly be thinking? And I don't think they're stupid people. They must have no. some story to tell. No, I know, Russ. It's, <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain, but I can say this. In, mo in modern monetary economics, it's not cool to talk about money and it's not cool to talk about quantities. And uh, <sighs> and so it's and behind this is this idea that if you have a fixed interest rate in the federal funds market, that's equivalent to letting the money supply be demand determined because if the demand for federal funds increases, that creates an outward shift in the demand for reserves, which is automatically accommodated by keeping the rate the same. The problem is that the demand for money is not does not Stand map up. nicely onto. Uh, 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 any given interest rate target, there is such a thing as a natural rate of interest that can fluctuate, and so everything depends on whether you're whether you're pegging the interest rate on federal funds at the right level or not. And this is where, when Vixel was great, Woodford is 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 a kind of a bastardized version of Vixel that 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 forgets about the underlying quantities. See, Vixel was very much a, a quantity theorist, but he had this interest rate dimension that made his version of the quantity theory very rich. In any event, without with too much going into too much detail, what was happening during 2007 and 8 uh is was that uh the demand for liquidity was going up. The natural interest rate was going down. The Fed was pegging uh, an interest rate that became higher than the natural rate, thinking it was doing the right thing, that it was accommodating all the necessary money demand and, and not noticing that spending and lending were collapsing. It was obsessed with 2% or whatever its target was. And for and 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 in order to maintain two percent, it made sure all of its emergency lending was sterilized as long as it could. Now, when Lehman's happened and then AIG, they 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 literally lacked enough treasuries. They were they down literally to five hundred. They literally what? 
lacked enough treasury securities in their portfolio to, to continue it. sterilizing. Yeah. They couldn't do it. They physically couldn't do it. They were adding trillions of dollars to their assets, uh, to their non-treasury assets, and they didn't have trillions of dollars of treasuries to sell. That's when quantitative easing began. Quantitative easing was their fancy name, or actually they preferred calling it in a large-scale asset purchases. But in any event, this was this was basically the name for uh, letting the Fed's balance sheet grow. We would, in the old days, call it monetary expansion, right? Federal Reserve monetary expansion. They in, they they took to quantitative easing because they had no choice. It wasn't something they talked about and said, "Oh, this is we got a theory. This is a great thing to do." They couldn't sterilize anymore because they didn't have enough treasuries. They, but there are various reasons why they keep a certain number of treasuries having to do with income and all that. And so, and they, they didn't want to let it fall much below about, I think it was about uh, 300, 300 uh, billion was what they tried to keep on hand. Uh, and then they started acquiring some longer term treasuries and built that up. But that was also part of quantitative easing. In any event, they couldn't sterilize. When they couldn't sterilize, they said, how are we going to keep the federal funds rate at 2% if we can't sterilize? Now we're expanding the balance sheet. There's more liquidity out there. There's more federal funds out there. The supply is growing. That's going to lower the, the equilibrium federal funds rate. What do we do? Ah, we'll pay interest on reserves. If we pay interest on reserves, first of all, we establish a kind of a floor, for the, a different floor for the federal funds rate. But the real goal was to see to it that the that the new Federal Reserve dollars being created would not be lent, would be held on to. It wasn't, and they, 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 they speak <laughs> uh, uh, this way, and they're, you, I, can, I will get you those quotes together. I'm, it can, a future blog uh, I'm planning is on interest on reserves. Uh, the idea was to have an alternative means by which to make sure that this extra, these extra dollars would not translate into any corresponding amount of uh, lending and spending, even the though strangest, the economy yeah. is desperately in need of more lending and spending. It's the strangest. It's you know, I want to believe you, George, because I'm a, I'm a conspiracist of sorts on this. I, I'm eager. <laughs> I know. And, and I know. my worst, my worst side, <laughs> by the way, it's worse than that because I really am worried. My real fear is that their real motive was to get the toxic assets off the bank's books because that was good for the banks. So I have an even creepier that's theory their, than – That was their motive. That's right. That's it's creepy, their motive that's creepier for buying than, the assets. That's creepier it's than not stupidity. their motive for paying interest on reserves. Oh, well, that's nice too because that helps them rebuild their balance sheets. And so you know, that's like it gets them through the crisis for a while. I, that's the creepiest interpretation of this. It's not stupidity. It's just – it's it's corruption, uh, implicit corruption. It's not literal. Uh, but but remember, if banks are really need to have uh, reserves, they don't need to be paid to hold them. You only need to pay them to hold them if 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 they if you don't pay them, they're going to lend them. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's hard and to argue with that. Yeah, that yeah. is exactly what the Fed was worried about. They were worried that le that the banks were going to lend the extra reserves that the Fed could no longer avoid creating as a result of the massive asset acquisitions it was engaging in. And they were determined. They, and mind you, I mean, putting conspiracy uh, theories aside, they thought that this was important because they, they felt this was what they needed to do to maintain control of what they perceived to be Monetary policy, which was control of interest rates. Yeah, I said conspiracists. I really meant uh, that the incentives were there to to get them to do things that that don't look so attractive. Uh, I'm going to give. I, I don't get to quote Joseph, Joseph Stiglitz very often, so he calls it cog cognitive capture, which I really like. <laughs> so I'm, I'm arguing in, in my uh, somewhat depressing, sinister view of the world in this area that the Fed was cognitively captured by the fact that they're listening all day to other bankers and, and investment bank folks who are on their board, and their natural incentive is to listen to their worries rather than thinking about the bigger picture. But this this confirms all my worst, creepiest stories, George, so I'm a little bit worried about it. We're gonna have, we're gonna I'm have worried to about it, too, because I don't <laughs> like saying things that make it sound like uh, I'm crazy. <laughs> yeah. but, but I can tell you if the quotes, if there weren't abundant quotes backing me up on this. And By the way, I need to talk about market monetarists. And we, because, sure. Uh, one Go of ahead. the things that 
you know, <clears throat> uh, th th there's this line out there. I, I am sort of a market monetarist fellow traveler in the sense that, as you can tell from my remarks, I think ultimately monetary policy is about keeping a stable flow of spending in the economy. I mean, that, to me, that's, that is the essence of, of, of monetary policy. If, you're, if your spending is collapsing, you've got a monetary system out of whack. Whether it's gold or or central bank, I don't care. Spend stable spending is is uh, what a uh, properly organized monetary system should be able to maintain. Okay. However, it doesn't follow from that and from the fact that spending uh, that uh, 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 spending in fact collapsed that one has to be a believer in quantitative easing. In this case. I'm not. I disagree with market monetarists who say quantitative easing was a good thing. Why? Because under the circumstances, the Fed was uh, engaged in quantitative easing, but at the same time, it, it made sure that this easing would not increase total spending. It took steps, including interest on reserves, especially interest on reserves, that were calculated to make sure that quantitative easing in this case, in, these, in this uh, situation, would not have the effect of reviving demand. Well, if it's not going to do that, I'm against it because what it did do is give us a Fed four times as big as before. It created tremendous uh, uh, problems with uh, uh, exit problems that we have yet to uh, see the end of. We're, we're, we're just getting into that new act. And uh, it, there are all kinds of political economy reasons to uh, not want to see a four and a half trillion dollar Fed created. Uh, 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 there was no no point in it. I've made the analogy, the following analogy: suppose that you have a car that keeps sputtering out, right? And some of your uh, friends say, "Well, it's running out of gas." It's got an empty tank. We need to pour more gas in there. Well, they'd be absolutely right, except what if there's a leak in the tank and the gas you pour in is pouring right out into the asphalt? Then wouldn't you have a reason to argue against putting more gas into the tank until you've dealt with these, this other problem? It doesn't mean that you don't understand in internal combustion engines and how they work. It means that you know there's a leak. <laughs> and uh, so I'm not against QE because I disagree with the belief that such easing under normal circumstances can serve to revive demand when it's been flagging. I'm against easing this time because it's accompanied by other policies that are calculated to make sure the easing has bad effects but no, none of the good consequences that we really want from it and that we can ease till kingdom come without doing the economy any good and putting ourselves in the process into a very dangerous situation. My guest today has been George Selgin. <laughs> He's at the Cato Institute. He blogs at Alt M. Uh, I usually try to end on a cheery note. I give up on this <laughs> one, but I'm afraid you're right. I'm worried you're right, and we will have to continue – uh, this conversation in the future. George, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. You're welcome, Russ. Thank you for letting me uh, <laughs> vent. <laughs> thanks. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.